Welcome, stranger, to another ghastly tale's narration. Dim the lights and pull up close to the fire, for this evening I have a chilling tale of human ghouls who defile the dead and an inhuman charnel horror that preys upon the living. This is The Hound by H. P. Lovecraft. In my tortured ears, there sounds unceasingly a nightmare whirring and flapping, and a faint, distant baying as of some gigantic hound. It is not dream, it is not, I fear, even madness, for too much has already happened to give me these merciful doubts. Sinjin is a mangled corpse, I alone know why and such is my knowledge that I am about to blow out my brains for fear I shall be mangled in the same way down unlit and illimitable corridors of eldritch fantasy sweeps the black, shapeless nemesis that drives me to self-annihilation. May heaven forgive the folly and morbidity which led us both to so monstrous a fate. We read with the commonplaces of a prosaic world where even the joys of romance and adventure soon grow stale. Sinjin and I had followed enthusiastically every aesthetic and intellectual movement which promised respite from our devastating ennui. The enigmas of the symbolists and the ecstasies of the pre-Raphaelites were all ours in their time, but each new mood was drained too soon of its diverting novelty and appeal. Only the sombre philosophy of the decadence could help us, and this we found potent only by increasing gradually the depth and diabolism of our penetrations. Baudelaire and Huysmans were soon exhausted of thrills, till finally there remained for us only the more direct stimuli of unnatural personal experiences and adventures. It was this frightful emotional need which led us eventually to that detestable course which even in my present fear I mention with shame and timidity, that hideous extremity of human outrage, the abhorred practice of grave robbing. I cannot reveal the details of our shocking expeditions, or catalogue even partly the worst of the trophies adorning the nameless museum we prepared in the great stone house where we jointly dwelt, alone and servantless. Our museum was a blasphemous, unthinkable place, where, with the satanic taste of neurotic virtuosi, we had assembled a universe of terror and decay to excite our jaded sensibilities. It was a strange room, secret, far, far underground, where huge winged demons carved of basalt and onyx vomited from wide, grinning mouths, weird green and orange light, and hidden pneumatic pipes ruffled into kaleidoscopic dances of death, the lines of red charnel things hand in hand, woven in voluminous black hangings. Through these pipes came at will the odours our moods most craved, sometimes the scent of pale funeral lilies, sometimes the narcotic incense of imagined eastern shrines of the kingly dead, and sometimes, how I shudder to recall it, the frightful soul-upheaving stenches of the uncovered grave. Around the walls of this repellent chamber were cases of antique mummies, alternating with comely, lifelike bodies, perfectly stuffed and cured by the taxidermist's art, and with headstones snatched from the oldest churchyards of the world. Niches here and there contained skulls of all shapes, and heads preserved in various stages of dissolution, there one might find the rotting, bald pates of famous noblemen, and the fresh and radiantly golden heads of new-buried children. Statues and paintings there were, all of fiendish subjects and some executed by Sinjin and myself. A locked portfolio, bound in tanned human skin, held certain unknown and unnameable drawings which it was rumoured Goya had perpetrated but dared not acknowledge. There were nauseous musical instruments, stringed brass and woodwind, on which Sinjin and I sometimes produced dissonances of exquisite morbidity and cacodemoniacal ghastliness, 
whilst in a multitude of inlaid ebony cabinets repose the most incredible and unimaginable variety of tomb loot ever assembled by human madness and perversity. It is of this loot in particular that I must not speak. Thank God I had the courage to destroy it, long before I thought of destroying myself. The predatory excursions on which we collected our unmentionable treasures were always artistically memorable events. We were no vulgar ghouls, but worked only under certain conditions of mood, landscape, environment, weather, season and moonlight. These pastimes were to us the most exquisite form of aesthetic expression, and we gave their details a fastidious technical care. An inappropriate hour, a jarring lighting effect or a clumsy manipulation of the damp sod would almost totally destroy for us that ecstatic titillation which followed the exhumation of some ominous, grinning secret of the earth. Our quest for novel scenes and piquant conditions was feverish and insatiate. Sinjin was always the leader, and he it was, who led us the way at last to that mocking, accursed spot which brought us our hideous and inevitable doom. By what malign fatality were we lured to that terrible Holland churchyard? I think it was the dark rumour and legendary the tales of one buried for five centuries, who had himself been a ghoul in his time, and had stolen a potent thing from a mighty sepulchre. I can recall the scene in these final moments, the pale autumnal moon over the graves, casting long horrible shadows, the grotesque trees drooping sullenly to meet the neglected grass and the crumbling slabs, the vast legions of strangely colossal bats that flew against the moon, the antique ivied church pointing a huge spectral finger at the livid sky, the phosphorescent insects that danced like death fires under the yews in a distant corner, the odours of mould, vegetation and less explicable things that mingled feebly with the night wind from over far swamps and seas, and worst of all, the faint, deep-toned baying of some gigantic hound which we could neither see nor definitely place. As we heard this suggestion of baying, we shuddered, remembering the tales of the peasantry, for he whom we sought had centuries before been found in this self-same spot, torn and mangled by the claws and teeth of some unspeakable beast. I remember how we delved in the ghoul's grave with our spades, how we thrilled at the picture of ourselves the grave, the pale watching moon, the horrible shadows, the grotesque trees, the titanic bats, the antique church, the dancing death fires, the sickening odours, the gently moaning night wind, and the strange half-heard directionless being of whose objective existence we could scarcely be sure. Then we struck a substance harder than the damp mould, and beheld a rotting oblong box crusted with mineral deposits from the long, undisturbed ground. It was incredibly tough and thick, but so old that we finally pried it open and feasted our eyes on what it held. Much, amazingly much, was left of the object despite the lapse of five hundred years. The skeleton, though crushed in places by the jaws of the thing that had killed it, held together with surprising firmness and we gloated over the clean white skull and its long, firm teeth and its eyeless sockets that once had glowed with a charnel fever like our own. In the coffin lay an amulet of curious and exotic design, which had apparently been worn around the sleeper's neck. It was the oddly conventionalized figure of a crouching, winged hound, or a sphinx with a semi-canine face and was exquisitely carved in antique oriental fashion from a small piece of green jade. The expression of its features was repellent in the extreme, savouring at once of death, bestiality and malevolence. Around the base was an inscription in characters which neither Sinjin nor I could identify, and on the bottom, like a maker's seal, was graven a grotesque and formidable skull. Immediately upon beholding this amulet, 
we knew that we must possess it, that this treasure alone was our logical pelf from the centuried grave. Even had its outlines been unfamiliar, we would have desired it. But as we looked more closely, we saw that it was not wholly unfamiliar. Alien it indeed was, to all art and literature which sane and balanced readers know, but we recognized it as the thing hinted of in the forbidden Necronomicon of the mad Arab Abdul al Hazrid, the ghastly soul symbol of the corpse eating cult of inaccessible Lang in Central Asia. All too well did we trace the sinister lineaments described by the old Arab demonologist. Lineaments, he wrote, drawn from some obscure supernatural manifestation of the souls of those who vexed and gnawed at the dead. Seizing the green jade object, we gave a last glance at the bleached and cavern-eyed face of its owner and closed up the grave as we found it. As we hastened from the abhorred spot, the stolen amulet in St. John's pocket, we thought we saw the bats descend in a body to the earth we had so lately rifled, as if seeking for some cursed and unholy nourishment. But the autumn moon shone weak and pale, and we could not be sure. So too, as we sallied the next day away from Holland to our home, we thought we heard the faint, distant baying of some gigantic hound in the background. But the autumn wind moaned sad and wan, and we could not be sure. Less than a week after our return to England, strange things began to happen. We lived as recluses, devoid of friends, alone and without servants in a few rooms of an ancient manor house on a bleak and unfrequented moor, so that our doors were seldom disturbed by the knock of the visitor. Now, however, we were troubled by what seemed to be a frequent fumbling in the night, not only around the doors but around the windows also, upper as well as lower. Once we fancied that a large, opaque body darkened the library window when the moon was shining against it, and another time we thought we heard a whirring or flapping sound not far off. On each occasion, investigation revealed nothing, and we began to ascribe the occurrences to imagination, which still prolonged in our ears the faint, far being we thought we had heard in the Holland churchyard. The jade amulet now reposed in a niche in our museum, and sometimes we burned a strangely scented candle before it. We read much in Al Hazred's Necronomicon about its properties, and about the relation of ghost souls to objects it symbolized, and were disturbed by what we read. Then the terror came. On the night of September 24th, I heard a knock at my chamber door. Fancying it St. John's, I bade the knocker enter, but was answered only by a shrill laugh. There was no one in the corridor. When I aroused St. John from his sleep, he professed entire ignorance of the event and became as worried as I. It was the night the faint, distant baying over the moon became to us a certain and dreaded reality. Four days later, whilst we were both in the hidden museum, there came a low, cautious scratching at the single door which led to the secret library staircase. Our alarm was now divided, for, besides our fear of the unknown, we had always entertained a dread that our grisly collection might be discovered. Extinguishing all lights, we proceeded to the door and threw it suddenly open whereupon we felt an unaccountable rush of air, and heard, as if receding far away, a queer combination of rustling, tittering, and articulate chatter. Whether we were mad, dreaming, or in our senses, we did not try to determine. We only realized, with the blackest of apprehensions, that the apparently disembodied chatter was beyond a doubt in the Dutch language. After that, we lived in growing horror and fascination. Mostly we held to the theory that we were jointly going mad from our life of unnatural excitements, but sometimes it pleased us more to dramatize ourselves as the victims of some creeping and appalling doom. 
Bizarre manifestations were now too frequent to count. Our lonely house was seemingly alive with the presence of some malign being whose nature we could not guess, and every night that demoniac being rolled over the windswept moor, always louder and louder. On October the 29th, we found in the soft earth underneath the library window a series of footprints utterly impossible to describe. They were as baffling as the hordes of great bats which haunted the old manor house in unprecedented and increasing numbers. The horror reached a culmination on November 18th when St. John, walking home after dark from the dismal railway station, was seized by some frightful carnivorous thing and torn to ribbons. His screams had reached the house and I had hastened to the terrible scene in time to hear a whir of wings and a vague black cloudy thing silhouetted against the rising moon. My friend was dying when I spoke to him, and he could not answer coherently. All he could do was whisper, The amulet! That damned thing! Then he collapsed, an inert mass of mangled flesh. I buried him the next midnight in one of our neglected gardens, and mumbled over his body one of the devilish rituals he had loved in life. And as I pronounced the last demoniac sentence, I heard afar on the moor the faint being of the gigantic hound. The moon was up, but I dared not look at it. And when I saw on the dim-lighted moor a white, nebulous shadow sweeping from mound to mound, I shut my eyes and threw myself face down upon the ground, when I arose, trembling, I know not how much later, I staggered to the house and made shocking obeisances before the enshrined amulet of green jade. Being now afraid to live alone in the ancient house on the moor, I departed the following day for London, taking with me the amulet after destroying by fire and burial the rest of the impious collection in the museum. But after three nights, I heard the baying again, and before a week was over, felt strange eyes upon me whenever it was dark. One evening, as I strolled on Victoria Embankment for some much-needed air, I saw a black shape obscure one of the reflections of the lamps in the water. A wind, stronger than the night wind, rushed by, and I knew that what had befallen St. John must soon befall me. The next day, I carefully wrapped the green jade amulet and sailed for Holland. What mercy I might gain by returning the thing to its silent, sleeping owner, I knew not, but I felt that I must try any step conceivably logical. What the hound was, and why it had pursued me, were questions still vague, but I had first heard the baying in that ancient churchyard, and every subsequent event including St. John's dying whisper, had served to connect the curse with the stealing of the amulet. Accordingly, I sank into the nethermost abysses of despair when, in an inn at Rotterdam, I discovered that thieves had despoiled me of this sole means of salvation. The baying was loud that evening, and in the morning I read of a nameless deed in the vilest quarter of the city. The rabble were in terror, for upon an evil tenement had fallen a red death beyond the foulest previous crime of the neighbourhood. In a squalid thieves den an entire family had been torn to shreds by an unknown thing which left no trace, and those around had heard all night a faint, deep, insistent note, as of a gigantic hound. So at last I stood again in the unwholesome churchyard, where a pale winter moon cast hideous shadows and leafless trees drooped sullenly to meet the withered frosty grass and cracking slabs, and the ivied church pointed a jeering finger at the unfriendly sky, and the night wind howled maniacally over the frozen swamps and frigid seas. The baying was very faint now, and it ceased altogether as I approached the ancient grave I had once violated and frightened away an abnormally large horde of bats which had been hovering curiously around it. 
I know not why I went thither unless to pray, or gibber out insane pleas and apologies to the calm white thing that lay within, but whatever my reason, I attacked the half-frozen sod with a desperation partly mine and partly that of a dominating will outside myself. Excavation was much easier than I had expected, though at one point I encountered a queer interruption when a lean vulture darted down out of the cold sky and pecked frantically at the grave earth until I killed him with a blow of my spade. Finally, I reached the rotting oblong box and discovered the damp nitrous cover. This is the last rational act I ever performed. For crouched within that centuried coffin, embraced by a close-packed nightmare retinue of huge, sinewy, sleeping bats, was the bony thing my friend and I had robbed, not clean and placid as we had seen it then, but covered with caked blood and shreds of alien flesh and hair, and jeering sentiently at me with phosphorescent sockets and damp, exsanguined fangs yawning twistedly in mockery of my inevitable doom. And when it gave from those grinning jaws a deep sardonic bay as of some gigantic hound, and I saw that it held in its gory, filthy claw the lost and fateful amulet of green jade, I merely screamed and ran away idiotically, my screams soon devolving into peals of hysterical laughter. Madness rides the star wind, claws and teeth sharpened on centuries of corpses, dripping death astride a bacchanal of bats from nigh-black ruins of buried temples of Belial. Now, as the being of that dead, fleshless monstrosity grows louder and louder, and the stealthy whirring and flapping of those accursed web wings closer and closer. I shall seek with my revolver the oblivion which is my only refuge from the unnamed and unnameable. This has been a Ghastly Tales production. Narration by Martin Yates, accompanying music by Kevin MacLeod, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. For full credits, please see the description. I hope you've enjoyed this reading. If you have, please subscribe to Ghastly Tales on YouTube or find Ghastly Tales Presents on Facebook for more horror narrations, short films, reviews, live streams, discussion, and more. Good night, listener. And remember, of those twisted souls who plumb the depths of human depravity, be their course a morbid infatuation, a destructive paraphilia, or a chemical addiction, few deliberately set out to immerse themselves in tragedy. Like the nameless anti-hero of the Hound, most are submerged by gradual degrees, each inch seeming but a trivial progression from the last, until they are drowned in madness. All of us have our weaknesses, our vices, our follies, and in the deepest trench of the psyche, where only obsession may lead you, there is a doorway at which you may hear a low, cautious scratching. It is best not to make the descent in the first place, but if you, listener, are foolhardy enough to be drawn down, I have only one remaining piece of advice. Don't open that door. <laughs>